Hi, I'm Al Dare. We're here at the sixth annual Taiwan On, sponsored by the Iroquois chapter of Trout Unlimited at the Genesee Grand Hotel on this fine March winter day. And uh, I'm telling you, there's a ton of people here today exhibiting their fly tying skills. There's a lot of materials that are being shown, rods, reels, fly fishing, you name it. But you know, Trout Unlimited, is an amazing organization, a conservation organization, their mission being cold, clean water that not just benefits the trout or the trout fishermen. Think about this for a second. You're talking warm water fishing, all kinds of fish that depend on clean and cold water. Not only do the fish depend on it, but we as global citizens depend on the fact that we have ample supplies of cold, clean water. So what's being exhibited here today is more than just about tying flies and talking fly fishing. And that point doesn't often get uh, recognized. Uh, it's also a philanthropic type endeavor. We're benefiting several uh, not-for-profit organizations. We have Casting for Recovery. We have uh, Carpenter's Brook Fish Hatchery. We have uh, Project Healing Waters also being uh, benefited by this event. It's truly more than just fly tying and fly fishing. So welcome to this event. We're going to be doing some great interviews and uh, hang out and see what, uh, see what comes about. Thanks a lot. I'm Al Dare with Mickey's Bait and Tackle. Take care now. Hey, we're here with Joe Fox with the Deddy Fly Shop, Deddy's, Roscoe, you probably heard the name. How long have the Deddy's in that shop been around, Joe? Oh, this is our 89th year since 1928. Wow, you beat us by a few years. We're like going on 67, I think, this year. You know, you and I are custodians of some of the oldest shops in the country. Of course, mine's not a fly shop. It's more general bait and tackle and such, but there was a day when the Deddies would sell General Tackle, if my memory serves me correct. A little bit of General Tackle. My grandmother also used to grow worms in the basement. There you go. Oh, boy, that's true. As a kid, you know, you have to make a couple extra bucks. And <laughs> Tom Rosenbauer admitted that to me the last time we interviewed him. He was packing worms in the basement of Vads back in the 60s. So Apparently, back in the day, it was quite an easy way to make a few bucks. Well, the Deddies, uh, Dan Bailey, Fran Betters, Mickey's, we sold Fly Tackle and bait. I mean, it was all encompassed, you know, then around what? I think it was around 67, Fly Fishing Magazine, Fly Fisherman Magazine came out 69, somewhere then. And then the, the, the worm started to turn, so to speak, and fly fishing became more of a boutique sort of uh, existence for, and very specialized. Almost changed to more of a lifestyle activity. Yeah. You know, a little bit less from a sport and more of a, a way to life that you know people plan their year around their fishing. It you know, their life in their year. It does. It's really be taken on a new meaning. Uh, it's morphed. Let's, yeah. And there's been a bit of a resurgence in that, actually. Uh, fly fishing has a bit of a, a renaissance right now, where we're seeing a lot of things that happened in the early 70s happening again, um, with the younger generation of millennials and hipsters that are coming up. Like how? Like, what do you think? Give me specific A lot of new young people into the sport. Um, they have a, a big interest in not only fishing, but just incorporating into their life. And, you know, Kind of, they look back at the things that were done before. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit of uh, an escape from the their normal world, and also as a way to hang out with friends and to connect with people. Do you think that they revere some of the earlier traditions? I mean, you pick up a copy of the Drake magazine and you see a totally different culture shift. Even in the way they wear, they wear that they like the, the chest packs. The old oh, guys like the vests. You guys are just jealous you didn't think of the chest packs. <laughs> that's true. Um, I, I do think that's a part of it. It's uh, it's what the each generation has to work with. Yep. Um, I think my great grandfather would have worn a chest pack if they had chest packs. Probably. You know, a vest was a new thing back then. Yeah, well, um, and they were you know embracing that. Um, I think young people in the sport do, uh, they really do appreciate the generations before them. But remember, young people get in the sport to catch fish. Um, that comes with time. You know, you start to look back, and the more you fish and the more you appreciate everything about the fishing. It seems that, yeah, you get, as I say, less blood in your eye the older you get. That's true. Yeah, it's not about the numbers as much as it is about the experience. That's right. Yeah, that's for sure. And, and that's what fly fishing is, it's such an easy way to have a, a very nice experience on your a time away from you know work and, and your normal life. 
And I think that's the appeal of it with a lot of young people. No question about it. Hey, these last few years, I don't know about you, but I can tell you right now from my own experience with the weather and all, I'm going back about 12, 15 years. We haven't had a decent ice season and I can't remember. And I know that uh, the, during the hot periods of the summer months, that certainly has been really an effect on our trout streams. Whether you attribute it to global climate change or not, that's obviously had, had an effect on your business as well as mine. It, it's had weird effects. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say that business was worse because of it, but it was unpredictable. Um, I look at my bins at the end of the season and the big hatches like March Browns, Green Drakes, Isonicias, they weren't great sellers. A lot of small bugs and nymphs are good sellers because those were the hatches that people got to take advantage of. Um, so people were still fishing, but their behaviors changed a lot, kind of to match the behaviors of the hatches. Well, they, they closed the Freestones last summer. Uh, yeah, the Asopus closed last year mm -hmm. um, in the uh, northern Catskills. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were discouraging people from fishing the beaver kill and the willow a yeah. good part of the year. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's very it's very troubling. Not that warm water, you know, that's kind of a normal thing every summer in a Freestone. Sure, yeah, it is. But you don't expect it to happen that early and for so long. Yeah. Um, and how unpredictable it is, yeah. too. I mean, yeah. we're, we're having low water when we should have high water. We're, we're having these warm spells. They're not overly, like, too hot, but they just go on and on and on for weeks. Um, and, and that's the big, you know, the inconsistency with the past is the problem. Yeah, I'm finding that the unpredictability factor has been our nemesis. Uh, boy, I'll tell you. Hey, what do you see for the future of fly fishing, though? You know. Um, I, I actually think fly fishing has a nice future. We have a lot of conservation issues that might become problems if you know these weather patterns continue. But there are so many people under 35 in the sport right now, and they really and they appreciate the sport for the right reason. It's, it's not an extreme sport to them. It's that escape and that kind of that lifestyle they enjoy. And if they continue with that, you know, going over the next 10 years, I think the sport's going to be in a good place. Yeah, I'm a firm believer that the fly fishing culture in general are very conservation, very environmentally aware. And they, well, this is a TU event. Let's face oh, it. yeah. They're, you know, it's definitely they're aware, but they need to act. I think that's coming, too. Yeah. I really do. And if it's not already here with some millennials, especially, I really believe the millennials get it. They get it even more so than some of my own generation in terms of what's going on. Hey, you guys still tie flies for the shop or what? Not as much as I should. Uh, we have some great tires in the shop. Um, got about quite a few tires now. Uh, all of our flies are still domestically tied, but I don't get nearly the time behind the vice as I should. But you sell a lot of U.S. tied flies. We do. Um, and if you want to have a real good quality fly, they have to be. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly. It'd be kind of nice to see that industry come back the way it used to be in the days of the round table. And when you could go into like Dan Bailey's and see everybody out in front, all the ladies and gentlemen tying flies. Um, it's coming back in a different way. Um, the internet's already opened it up for for domestic tires to sell direct. Yeah. Um, so that's that's changed a bit. The big problem always is, you know, you look at the, the big outfits that sell imported flies sure. and they're almost the same price as our American oh, tied flies. No. And they cost them a fraction of the amount. Yeah. You know, so fly prices are already not aligned where they should be in terms of domestically tied, yeah. but it's getting there. Yeah, I think so. I think things are better things are yet to occur with, with our with our sport. I'm always optimistic. Hey, thanks Joe. No All problem. Right, we'll be in touch, okay? If you ever get Definitely. down to North Syracuse, come down and see me. I'll do the same. Will do. All right, bud. Hey, we're here today with a couple of good old boys. Uh, Tom Lenweaver, <laughs> who happens to be a local artist, wildlife specialist, and a good old friend of mine, Tony Carulla, who I happen to do a little fishing with once in a while. I think we've been fishing for about bit. 25, 30 years bit, now. Yeah, about 25, bit, 30, yeah. Okay. About time, time, about time you, to learn together. I mean, about time you took a break. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we might this year. <laughs> so, 
anyways, we're going to show you and talk with Tom about some of the art that he's devoted most of his existence to. He does mostly a fish, birds, I've seen him do horses and dogs, wildlife galore. And uh, Tom, when did you get interested in doing this? I mean, how long has it been? Now? Well, I've been doing this when I was in school is when I started. Uh, uh, what, what you're seeing behind me here and what, what you see at the shows I do is, uh, is the culmination of about tw the last 26 years. I, I picked back up after being in the commercial business uh, in 1990. And uh, so what you see here is since 20, 27 years now, going in 27 years, but uh, uh, I enjoy it. You know, it keeps, keeps me happy. I met, met this gentleman by uh, painting his dog. That's right. Uh, surprise, pre job. surprise present for your wife. That's right. Call, yeah. And now it's hanging in my room. You still keep, you still got it? You didn't sell it? Of course. It's worth yeah. a lot of money now. now. I'm saving it so I can get the big money. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you don't just paint the fish. You actually fish as well. Oh, yeah, I'm a bit of a fly fisher, but yeah. not, not, of the, not of the ilk that, that these gentlemen at the show are, or you. <laughs> that might be a good thing. Yeah. That might be yeah. a good thing, yeah. <laughs> Believe me. Because then you wouldn't get any painting done. <laughs> But I, I enjoy it. I'm, I'm a tie yeah. flyer, not a good one, and uh, but uh, it's 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 fun and it's venues like this. I've met a lot of nice people through this. No uh, I really have, yeah. and my art, you know, uh, yeah. it's uh, it's been a humbling, rewarding. Uh, it kind of makes us feel lucky to be who we are because when you see who we're benefiting today, you know, casting for it really is, yeah, uh, and some of the uh, not for profits. Yep. yep. It, it really humbles you. And but, I, uh, I donate, I've donated a, a number of pieces for the different uh, hunting and fishing groups. Uh, and uh, right. they, they, they uh, auction them off at the auctions, and they get a heck of a lot more money than I'm able to, so uh, <laughs> more, more power to them. Yeah, I actually won one of your pieces at a sportsman's dinner. You did? The Bob Rittberger dinner. Oh, oh yeah, I, I, yeah I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a nice, that's right. a nice. No question about it, Tom. You're a household name within the uh, central New York sporting community, and a lot right. of your art. You, like, you mean like Lysol? And <laughs> it does reflect that. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, we're proud to have you here today, and oh. I, wanna, I want James to sort of pan some of the stuff that you've uh, that you've accomplished over the years. Thank you for your kind words. Yeah. All right, good. Good to see you here. Yep, same here. Yep. Hey, we're here with Anthony Hyatt, like the hotel, and he's the vice president of the Central New York Iroquois chapter of Trout Unlimited, and these are the guys that put this together today, and I got a few questions I want to ask this gentleman, because I know he puts a lot of work into it. Anthony happens to be an artist as well, so he's done all the art for all the posters. How's it going, man? At Bell, it's going fantastic. Uh, really good show this year. Um, the headliners are just outstanding, you know, Lefty and Bob Clouser. Uh, we've got some local people, you know, talking, Andy Dober talking about Montana, you know, fishing. Um, you know, some just phenomenal tires going on. You, know, oh, some, you, 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 you couldn't find these people anywhere else. No, the skill set that's being represented today in the way of tying is beyond me. I mean, I've been tying for a while, but I'm seeing young kids today that have been tying like they've been tying for 40 years. No, know? I know, I know. It's crazy. Very envious. Um, Pat Cohen, one of the premier tires here, you know, deer hair, you know, he just ties up a fly that is just phenomenally. I mean, you don't even want to fish it. It looks so good. You yeah. just want to put it on oh, your shelf. Yeah. But he wants you to yeah. fish them. I mean, they're yeah. really good looking yeah. flies. He does nice carp flies, too. Yes, he does. And his dubbing. I'm looking forward to interviewing him with Bob Clouser. I guess they're doing a bass fishing presentation today. Yes. Here. A lot of good presentations. Yeah, we have five here today. Is that yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. Man, I'll tell you, if you're a fly fisherman, and you live in central New York, and you're not here today, shame on you, because this is really something. This doesn't happen anywhere else, I think, like this, at this scale. Maybe the uh, the fly tying uh, thing in Jersey that they do every year. Other yeah. than that, this this nothing comes close to this. We're a little mini Somerset up, yeah. up here in central New York. Yeah, I think yeah. so. And we're so fortunate. You know, we've got some beautiful water. Nine Mile Limestone, limestone Butter Dot, Chittenango, which in about another week or so are going to be inundated with anglers. And I know your chapter at TU's 
they do a lot of work supporting the local Carpenters Brook Fish Hatchery. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, we do. I mean, one of the things that we do um, in May, we do help float stock uh, with Carpenters Brook Fish Hatchery. Um, this chapter, the Iroquois chapter, just donated $5,000 to uh, friends of Carpenters Brook Fish Hatchery for a new pond, educational pond that they could transport from one event to another. Um, it's a little small, maybe, you know, actually our, our venue's a little small to have the pond in here, but uh, think so. yeah. we'll, we'll put it together soon with them. Um, that's one of the things we do. You know, we do a lot of stream cleanup. Uh, a couple years back, we were over at uh, Limestone, and we helped uh, the town of Fayetteville, and they took out 10 dump trucks full oh of uh, tr you know, tires, just junk. And, just junk. Yeah. and uh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen some of the stuff that you've done at the uh, the park in Manulis, is it? Uh, Mill Run? Yeah, we've done some of yeah, that work. Yeah, some amazing stream improvement there. Uh, that's, you know, you guys aren't just about tying flies. I think I, men I mentioned that earlier. There's a lot of conservation stuff that's going on, environmental uh, stuff that's going on, and the clean, cold water, that benefits everyone, not just fly fishermen, oh, right. not just trout fishermen, yeah, but everybody really benefits from that in the community. It'd be nice to get a little more community recognition for that as well. Maybe this will help. Maybe. So, yeah. hey, thanks a lot, Anthony. Yeah, it's really thank good you. time, brother. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. about their connection with the Iroquois chapter of Trout Unlimited. What do you say, ladies? Uh, the Taiwan On event is awesome. Many women here today, which we are encouraging to join. So uh, I think it's all in all, this event has been, um, this year has been probably the most women I've seen. That's kind, of, yeah. it's kind of like a trend, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, I noticed they're one of the fastest growing segments of the fly fishing sport is the women component. I definitely noticed that. It's a good thing. What do you think, Kelly? What, do you, what, what exactly is your title now? You were involved <laughs> with, uh, but st at the state level, was it? With yes. The tr 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 yes, um, I'm the north... Uh, Oh, we need to edit this. <laughs> I can't remember what I'm. I'm the National Leadership Council representative for New Jersey, as well as the New Jersey State Council Women's and Diversity Initiative Coordinator. Oh. About seven years ago, Trout Unlimited National took the undertaking to advance more women, youth, and diversity in the sport of angling and conservation. So this is where Nancy and I partner up on a national level, representing New Jersey and New York collectively, along with other initiative chairs in different states, to create events, to promote outreach and education and support for networking of women, of youth, and other diverse groups in fly fishing. You know, that's a mouthful, but I got to tell you this, I've done some instruction over the years, and when it comes to women learning how to fly fish, they totally outpace the men. They are <laughs> such quick learners. Why is that? Why do they pick up fly tying and casting especially? What is it about women that seem to be a little ahead of the curve when it comes to that sort of thing? that they have, um, when it comes to the skill, a yeah, lighter touch. Totally. Uh, in fact, uh, recently I was helping out at a uh, fly fishing, just fly fishing school at the hatchery, and a lot of the participants were men. And I can just remember, like, the fly fishing instructor, like, looking around, you know, helping everyone, uh, just saying, don't beat the horse. <laughs> because that would, <laughs> what the guys would be like, oh, yeah. well. Too much power. <laughs> too much power. So. Yeah. So now I try to remember that myself when I'm casting. Don't beat the horse. Don't beat the horse. Yeah. Uh, but no, it is really apparent, even with fly time as well, and some of the uh, classes that I've had and there were women involved. But, you know, it's still a male-dominated sport, but gradually it's changing. There is an intimidation factor, I think, too. You know, it helps to, like, for instance, when you have a class of women, to have a woman instructor, I find. But uh, we're gradually getting there, I think. We're the, never the twain shall meet is, is I think, 
uh, on the way out the door. So mm -hmm. eventually I think we're going to see more men and women fly fish over the years. Uh, but I think women have always been involved in fly fishing, um, whether they've been fly tying or they've been guides. We look at Carrie Stevens in Maine. There's always been the historical aspect of it, but somewhere along the lines between the 40s and 50s, that nuclear family came into effect and women stepped away from that as, as an angling sport. But then you have ladies and pioneers like Joan Wolf, um, who's been casting her whole life practically um, and has brought that back into fashion. And how about Dame Juliana Berners, the woman that mm -hmm. wrote the first book ever on the sport? Yeah, the Treaty of Fly Fishing. In the 1400s, you know, I mm -hmm. always like to mention that. It was a woman that actually wrote the first book. That's, that's, pretty, that's really something. Hey, Nancy, you're, you're involved with the women in nature, aren't you? You go into women in nature? I, I don't go out to women in nature, but I do volunteer for their annual event. Uh, it comes up at the, at the end of April. Okay. So I help out with the uh, fly fishing mm -hmm. and this will be my my third year that I volunteer, and I just think it's amazing uh, of all the activities they have. You know, the women that participate in, in a one day, you know, they get to pick. I think I'm not sure how many, maybe two activities in the morning and two in the afternoon, kind of rotates around. And um, it's always over, you know, it's always filled up. Now. Yeah, they have more than enough. And a, oh, and a, and a couple of times, you know, we've been next to uh, like the Black Power or something, and yeah. it just makes you want to go try another, yeah, another sport. Yeah, I, I've been to a couple of them myself. Ed Pugliese, when he first kicked it off with, uh, oh, what's the other lady's name that was with that in the beginning days? Uh, anyways, uh, it's one of the fastest growing organizations I've ever seen in my life. They just went from zero to a thousand overnight, and their membership is, I think, well over 400. Yeah, so, uh, Kelly, we were talking earlier about Rachel up on the Osceola River. You, mm -hmm. Did you say you met her or you know Rachel? Yes, I'm very friendly with Rachel Finn. Yeah, she's quite a guide. I actually met she her, saw her on the river a few times when I was fishing the Osceola. Yeah, she's, she's a great woman. Um, she's a good friend. She's a great pioneer for women to be engaged in fly fishing and conservation and education. I see her smoking a big cigar every once in a while out there. I think that's to keep the bugs away. Maybe, perhaps. I haven't had a chance to fish with her yet. You know, I don't see that as being unfeminine either. I, maybe that's because I'm a cigar smoker on occasion. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like when the black flies are out on the Osceola River. If you don't have a cigar, you're finished. <laughs> you know? so. Hey, it's been great talking with you, great. ladies. Great, thank you. Good luck to you in the future with both your endeavors. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to continue on. Okay. Yep. Okay, are you ready for this? This is the Bob and Pat Show. All right, we got Bob Clauser and Pat Cohen here today at the Taiwan on 2017. So, hey guys, you know, I hear you're doing a presentation here today on warm water fishing for bass. Yeah. Not trout. This is Trout Unlimited. What are you bringing bass in here for? Well, that's a good re that, that is a good question. <laughs> I haven't even heard of a trout. You know what? My bass eat trout. Yeah, I believe so we that. need them to be unlimited because they're a food source. You know, it's nice to see this because trout unlimited means cold, clean water, and that obviously benefits more than just trout. Absolutely. Really Absolutely. We should get some of the bass guys to come here and support this organization in the future. And the pike guys. And I know you love to fish for carp. We should also yeah. get some of the trout guys to support our adventure. Too. Okay. That seems to be a big we're problem. All kind of, we're all in it together. We're all in it for the same reasons, all aren't we? Clean water. Yeah. Yeah, without clean water, we're done. We're all cooked. That's right. Yeah. So uh, tell me about your presentation as far as warm water fly fishing for bass. That seems to be gaining momentum. Definitely does. It's grown. It's grown huge in the last several years, anyway. But it's always been around. There's a long, long, long tradition of fly fishing for bass. Um, I mean, like I, I specialize in bass bugs in top water. It goes all the way back. Bass bugs date all the way back to the Seminole Indians, to the 17 and 1800s. Uh, they were dapping for them with long, long bamboo rods. So it's been around forever. It was forgotten about for a little while, though, I would say. 
Back in, uh, back in the 60s, 50s and 60s, uh, I'm a little older than Pat, but by uh, that much. We, on the Susquehanna River near Harrisburg, there was plenty of fly fishermen, even at that time, fishing the surface. The fishing streamers and nymph fishing was pretty much unheard of at that time. And I started guiding uh, in the 80s, and then we done all, we done streamer fishing, we done nymph fishing with fly, and of course, proper fishing. So it's been around a long time uh, using the fly rod as a method to catch bait. Well, when the water gets really warm because of the hot weather that we've been experiencing, there's nothing like taking a fly rod out to a pond and fish for bass. And my favorite happens to be panfish. I love fishing for the sunny sure. and the rockies. What, you guys fish for panfish, I'm sure, with the fly rod. What's your favorite flies for doing A little spider. little spider? What do you think? I would agree with that. Little spiders or, or little, little poppers with a spider dropper can be incredible for the big bull bluegill. That is such a blast on a fly rod. Absolutely. Decent-sized bluegill. Um, what about carp, Pat? Can you talk to me a little bit? I know you have a line of dubbing. Yeah, I love carp fishing. Um, it's probably the hardest, smartest, most finicky fish in fresh water. Um, long casts, accurate casts, everything about it is subtle. It's it's finesse fishing at its finest. I mean, if you sneeze, every fish in 50 yards is gone. It's uh, probably some of the most difficult technical fishing with a fly rod in fresh water that you'll ever experience. I believe you. I know yeah. I fish one with conventional tackle and it's tough. I can't imagine going after him with a fly rod. Something it's sight fishing to too, which nobody thinks of in warm water, sight fishing. Have you ever caught a carp on a clauser? Judging from the smile on your face, I'd say yes. Lots of them. Yeah. Uh, I like it because it's a big fish, and I like to put fun into things, and I tell the guys, look, if you want to go for carp, I'll take you on carp, and I'll guarantee you, you'll get your money's worth out of your fly line because you'll see the whole thing going out through the rod after you get hooked up. Plus your backing. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they say. Oh, yeah. You better have a decent eight way with a lot of backing. Absolutely. But it's a real sensitive fix, and it takes stalking, it takes uh, accurate casting, it takes eyesight to know when he's going to hit your fly. Uh, they can spit a fly out as quick as they suck it in if you're not going to get it. It's quite a fix. Very, very good. Yeah. Very difficult. It will humble you very quickly. Yeah, I'm going to try it. I mean, I, I have to do that. That's on my bucket list. Bob, what is, uh, in your opinion, what is the future for fly fishing? What do you see in your uh, crystal ball? Well, I see pollution as a detractor. And if we keep our waters clean, I don't see why the young people can't enjoy what we're doing. But the main factor is is our water quality. The environmental concern. Yeah, uh, guaranteed. Uh, that's the biggest downfall anywhere we've ever visited. Was uh, why would you want to buy a fly rod and a fly and go fishing water with a hook? You know, that's where I have to take my hat off to the Trout Unlimited organization and the, the people that affiliate themselves with it and their mission, that being clean, cold water. And enough isn't being said about that here today. Sure. And it, it benefits everyone. All the citizens of the globe, whether you fish or not, benefit from cold, clean water. Exactly. And, uh, hey, thanks for being here, guys. It was nice talking with you. All right, you take care. I'll be Thank you. Love using that dubbing, man. Oh, thank you. <laughs>
Hey, let me tell you, this is a very special moment right now. I am here with one of the pillars, okay? And that doesn't happen very often. And I don't, and I, don't, I say that from the bottom of my heart. Lefty Cray, thank you for coming to Syracuse. Thank you for being with the 6th Annual Taiwan On for the local chapter of Trout Unlimited, and I mean that. Lefty, how did you ever get started in fly fishing? What, what, can you go back a ways and tell me what? Yeah, and I, I got out of World War II and um, in 1945 and two or three years later a fellow who was doing a small column right outside of Baltimore, Maryland, fishing column, who, were, who later became very famous was named Joe Brooks and I had gotten the two or three years after I got out of the war I had gotten quite a reputation for catching smallmouth bass and uh, I'd done things like we we had big lures and I had a small lure. You couldn't cast, but well, this was before spinning. <laughs> uh, Use plug tackle. So I came up with an idea: drill a hole in the bottom, drill a hole in the top, and pump water in it. And you could cast it for a country. And I was doing a whole bunch of stuff like that. And uh, Joe Brooks wanted to write a, a column about what I was doing for his little newspaper. He was writing for it. We. I later wrote for the same thing. We got ten dollars, so it wasn't a big deal. Right. Yeah. But it was the start of his career, and he came with a fly rod. And nobody in Central Maryland, where I live, fly fished. I didn't know any. Fly I eventually found two in Baltimore. That was how few fly fishing were there. But we went usually, uh, or almost never, does like someone catch more fish than the local guy on his water. But Joe caught. A substantial a lot at lunchtime he was using a fly rod and I I couldn't see it much because he was in the front of the canoe what happened Albert at lunchtime he walked up on a ledge that the water was running down to and what happened was I didn't know it then it was in September there were billions of these uh, flying ants that were flying across from Virginia and millions of them didn't make it and fell in the water I didn't know any of that stuff. So he walks up after lunch and he's got this little black and white fly, which I later learned later was a black ghost. Now I was using silk line. That's when we had the dry lines every night, you know, so and rot. Yeah. And my line was as thick as a sewing needle and this fly line he had looked like a piece of rope. Well, he had this little tiny fly and a little ring appeared with the bass, of course, was taken. So he dropped one in that ring and caught a bass. Dropped in another ring, caught another bass. Well, after about six of these, I said, Joe, I got to have some of this. I said, this is, <laughs> so he gave me a, he said, if you drive to Baltimore tomorrow, which was 50 miles away, and I had a Model A Ford, so it took two and a half hours to drive down there where he was living at the time. And he selected a, a metalist reel and a glass rod nobody today would even cast with. And he was teaching this sort of technique. He took me out, gave me my first lesson, and Albert left town the next day. And I don't know if that's the reason. <laughs> anyway, I went home and just went nuts about it. And eventually got a lot of my friends into the thing. And then I found these two guys from Baltimore were doing it. So we had the whole place to ourselves at that time. But that, it just, uh, it, it was the first time, and I've, I've never the beginnings. Yeah. You know, I know. I normally, and I think a lot of other folks normally associate you with the beginning of saltwater fly fishing as well. You, you knew Mark Sosin, didn't you? Did oh, you? I Mark Sosin. I remember Mark Sosin. in New Jersey in 1965. Uh, Joe Brooks, uh, Charlie Waterman. Stan Gibbs, a very famous guy from up here, they asked about eight of us to come and form an organization. And Mark Sosen had just got out of business school and was selling fly fishing rods. Okay. And we got bonded together and we've been friends for, well, we wrote several books together. Yeah, I knew yeah. there was a relationship. Yeah, he, there. Uh, he and, uh, but yes, he's a very good friend. Um, but the way, I got, Joe Brooks got me a job in 1964 in Miami to run the largest fishing tournament in the world, which was really a premier job for an outdoor writer. 
I had been writing outdoor columns for a bunch of people and for magazines. And they got a quarter of a million entries in 16 weeks. I had nine secretaries. Huh. Uh, and it was the premier tournament in the world. They really promoted, we promoted uh, putting what fish back and all that. But what happened was all the editors from the big magazines and all that came down to Miami, which at that time, well, there were 22 guides in the Florida Keys. Wow. I mean, it was a paradise. Unbelievable. And we had these highly competitive uh, clubs down there that would compete every six months. To one, There was a spin, fly, plug, and so on, and they really competed. It really, in that early 60s and middle 70s, probably 80% of the techniques that we use today were developed mostly by those private clubs uh, and some guides on how to light tackle fishing and fly fishing in salt water. And I got letters from all over the United States of people who were coming down there to fish. And I got so many questions that I finally decided I'm going to write a book so I don't have to answer all these questions. And I didn't even, Albert, I didn't write the book for money. I, I did it to... Did it for love. Because everybody yeah. wanted to see get it, and nobody knew what to do. Yeah. And it turned out to be a, a good deal. I think we sold it for 40 years before they found it. Like, well, I have your saltwater fly tying manual of patterns. That was the same thing. That you signed for me about 15 years ago. <laughs> I don't want an old gray-haired man telling well, me that. Lefty, <laughs> I gotta ask you this. I gotta ask you this. You're the knot guy as far as I'm concerned. I know you've written several books on knots. Okay, when you we have a fly that has a turned up eye or a turned down eye, whether it be a salmon fly or a trout fly, should we all be using Terrell knots? Well, first of all, no knot breaks to a slip. That's the most important thing. So if you know a surgeon's knot, for example, and most guys do, you go through the overhand knot twice, pull tight. If you only pull the two long ones tight, you, I have a uh, $2,300 knot tester that has no opinion. And if you pull these uh, surge knot, these two tight, you, and didn't pull those two others tight, the two small ends, you can lose up to 30% of the strength of that knot because those are going to slip. The most important thing in tying knots is that if you got to get them is to keep them from slipping. What we were trying to do in those days, in Maine, in the 60s, and all, these clubs were trying to catch fish nobody had ever caught, amber jack on flies and all kind of stuff, that big snappers and small tuna and stuff. And we had to keep coming up with knots. And um, I had the, at the Miami Herald, those big tons of paper that they run through newspapers, they have to be critically adjusted or they're gonna tear when they're running through. They had a $5,000 net knot tester, a tension tester. I could test knots. In fact, for the first, first 16 years that we had the, uh, that world record thing that we started fly fishing, uh, Mark and I, he kept all the records, but I, tested 90% of the knots on that $5,000 tester. And we just kept four, for example, the Homer Road knot is a fairly good knot. Homer Road was a legendary pioneer fly fisherman. And he found out that you had to have a shock leader for tarpon. So he showed me this um, knot he was using, a loop knot, that he was using on his 100 pound piece at the end of the leader. And so I wrote this knot book, I called it the Homer Road Knot. Another one was uh, Norm Duncan, one of the guys at one of the clubs, he showed me the Norm Duncan. The Duncan Loop. The Duncan yeah. Loop, but. I live by that knot. But my best buddy down there was the outdoor editor, Vic Dunaway. We started Florida Sports and Magazine, him and I. But uh, he knew, I showed him this Duncan Loop Knot. Well, he, Vic figured a whole lot of ways to use that. Oh, yeah. And he sold the knot to DuPont, 
for a thousand dollars, you now call it the uni knot. The uni, yes. <laughs> it's the same yeah, knot. Yeah, exactly. I always call it the Duncan. Yeah, Pope. but we 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 worked with drags. Uh, we worked with how to fight big fish. For example, uh, there was a guy named uh, Henry Orr, who in Miami made a, one of the worst fly rods. <laughs> The only fly rod that we could use, <laughs> it was big around my finger at the glass, bottom and, and matched it. It would flop and wave at the fly as it yeah, cast yeah, at yeah. you. But uh, we caught enormous fish on it because it was so thick on the bottom. And late, years later, when we wanted to build, when they made a 20 pound class for fish, which was way heavier than what. I talking about now with the uh, we're talking about the uh, fly rods yeah the fly rods we had we didn't realize for big fish were all wrong they were stiff and everything we realize at sage that what really what you want to do what you catch really big fish like your huge stripers and tuna and stuff you want the whole upper end of that rod to collapse so you have a short lever to work with. Okay. And that was realized because of that terrible rod that we used in, in, in the 60s down there. It had influence on how we both. That, we re, and we used all kinds of lines. And, well, you guys were early saltwater pioneers, there's no doubt. Yeah, I'm we really were. Uh, kind of wrote the book. It well, I wrote the book because everybody kept asking questions. Yeah, yeah. and now it's like, uh, everything's etched in stone, what you guys have done, and you see saltwater fly fishing just going ballistic. Yeah. As, uh, yeah. As, a, as yeah. a component of the whole. The nice thing is a lot of women. Are, I the other that thing too. that's interesting, yeah. Albert, is that um, when I got married, we didn't have enough money to buy mosquito underwear. We were really poor. And um, I was writing little columns for local newspapers. And I realized that. The person who writes in an area, a region, knows a lot about their region, the outdoor writer. Yeah. But he doesn't know what's happening in Texas. He doesn't know what happened in California. or And I, I was the first one to realize that, that having that much more information, you had the ability to sell more articles. So I, I, I was lucky. I lived in Frederick, Maryland, near the National Geographic offices. The National Geographic photographers were interested in fly fishing, and I was interested in photography. So they gave me a, a big break in, in learning that. So I then decided that I would do fly fishing clinics and, and presentations and, with slides and all. And I was the first one to go to clubs all over the country, and they would pay my way. They'd pay me a little for doing it, and I always found out who the best fishermen were in the area, and I would end up spending, you know, when you're in your 20s and early 30s, all you need is a pickup and some Cokes or water and some cracked cheese and crackers. So I got to fish literally all over the world on somebody else's money. <laughs> That's pretty good. And was the one that really started all that there. Yeah. It wasn't smart, it just common Man. sense. Well. Lefty, it's been interesting. Thank you very much. Oh, I really right. appreciate you coming down and talking with us today. Right. Albert, right. where's my ring? <laughs> <laughs> Take care. It's been a good one. All right. Hey, Steve, it's good to see you here again. You're here just about every year with the uh, partridge and the regal vices and that, that amazing array of intricate fly streamer patterns. How are you doing today? Very good. Thank you. This is my fifth year here, actually. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, I'll tell you, the, uh, the Partridge line, it's good to see it back again after sort of going into hiatus for a little while. Well, it was taken by Mustad for a while. Now it's back in English hands, and uh, Mark Hamnett, the owner, has decided that he's going to make a major push into the U.S., so a lot of the patterns are geared to the U.S. market. It seems like there's a, uh, a definite uh, prejudice towards the wet fly streamers. I mean, I know Partridge makes a lot of dry fly hooks and traditional wet fly hooks, but there's a lot of attention being paid to streamers, saltwater, Atlantic salmon, steelhead. Well, I've got to admit that's pretty much my prejudice. And though I do a lot of dry flies, 
Uh, I find that this show attracts a lot of the streamer crowd. You know, the Catskills had uh, many streamers and then all the way up into Maine. So what do you think? How about that moment with Lefty Cray? Boy, I'll tell you, it was really a privilege to be able to sit down with one of trout fishing's, fly fishing's, fly tying's legends. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed just meeting with the guy. And uh, you know, go to TU's website so that you don't miss the next one that's coming up on uh, March the 24th. Go to Iroquois Chapter TU's website to get some details on that because it's around the corner here at the Genesee Grand. When it comes to, uh, to tying flies at the Taiwan on, there's more to it than just tying flies. And I, I think throughout the video, you kind of got that impression that I'd hammered that. And it's a message that's really, that really deserves repeating. Um, uh, TU and its mission is all about clean water, clean cold water, and it benefits everyone, whether you fish or not. So join your local chapter of Trout Unlimited. Get involved, roll up your sleeves, okay? Let's, uh, let's pursue that mantra. I'm Al Dare with Mickey's Bait and Tackle. Thanks for being with us today. We had a lot of fun, and we're going to do it again. Take care now.